イシャドウ切り裂くアクセルキシムハイウェイシティ助手席うつむくお前のルージュ色の憂いと Yakuza's annualization was a curse when examined from the Western audience's perspective. Nagoshi believed it wouldn't survive as a franchise if it didn't remain consistently on store shelves, so the Yakuza series is knowingly designed around their short development cycles. Except you're waiting an extra year on localization and missing out on some of those entries due to a low public interest in your area. Then, once you do get it, the localization has erased part of the Japanese identity of the video game taking place in Japan, which you bought to play as a character running around in Japan. And while you're playing the new Western Yakuza release, the next one in the franchise had come out two days ago. You knew there was a version of Yakuza 1, 2, or 3 out in the world with more authenticity. You knew a Yakuza 3 existed containing cut content you wanted, or one starring Kiryu as a samurai warrior in feudal Japan. You knew there were versions of the Yakuza trilogy calling Kiryu Kiryu and not Kazuma. Yasuhiro Noguchi knew the state of Yakuza's localization could have been better. You can thank him for correcting how the series referred to Kiryu in the West. It was a subtle change that I fought for to de westernize certain aspects of the legacy localization changes from Yakuza 1. Given the context, it would have been awkward if Kiryu was the only one that went by his first name. Noguchi acknowledged fans were upset by the removed content in Yakuza 3. Ensuring the Western version of Yakuza 4 shipped with Mahjong, the Hostess Bars, and the Hostess Management minigames intact. He even fought for the translation of signage and product ads exclusive to Japan. His work effectively laid the foundation for the series' future success outside of Japan by doing what past efforts didn't retain the authenticity of Yakuza's world. Fans were elated. The wait for a new Yakuza was worth it. Yakuza 4 didn't break sales records or explode in popularity, but it did give Western fans the Yakuza experience they had been clamoring for since the first one. This is a bit of an odd statement, because Yakuza 4 had a completely different approach to its overall design. Largely affected by its brand new narrative structure. We need to talk about Yakuza's development team leads. They're everywhere and always. Whether or not they're placed in a director's chair, the team of leads are this constant rotation of a handful of individuals working together regardless of the power structure. Their growing familiarity with one another was inevitably going to reflect itself in their combined work, so it was no surprise Yakuza 3's emphasis on brotherhood would then evolve into Yakuza 4's multiple protagonists. Nagoshi revealed three new playable characters in addition to Kiryu. Masayoshi Tanamura, an arrogant beat cop who joined the force to investigate the mysterious conditions surrounding his father's death. Taiga Saijima, an ex Yakuza on death row for the mass murder of a rival clan. And Shun Akiyama, an enigmatic moneylender with a pension for slacking off and a rather interesting loan plan. Yakuza 
Each protagonist would have their own playable sections, with a central narrative tying them together. And this was the best thing Yakuza could have ever done for itself. Hell yeah! You go, girl! The multiple protagonist approach allowed the Yakuza team to recontextualize existing gameplay elements against different characters. It gave the series a much needed dose of pacing and created its most influential entry. Yakuza 4 was about the city of Kamurocho itself, and provided a ton of world building the series didn't possess before. And it begins with a nap. This is Akiyama, and he's a slouch. Luckily, he's got someone just like Haruka to keep him honest. Hmm? Hey, Moshi Huh? Did I say like Haruka? I meant better. Oh. Oh. For Akiyama, collecting loan payments is less about the money and more about making sure people are making good on their promises. His first stop is the offices of Kanamura Enterprises, a third string family of the Tojo clan working under the Shibata family. And if you're thinking, third string Yakuza family sounds pretty damn unimpressive. You'd be absolutely right. This is Kido, captain of the Kanamura family. He's having some trouble explaining to the newer members of the Kanamura branch why it's not okay to be letting other Yakuza families crash their club. Akiyama steps in, putting it in terms the rookies understand. The boss himself apparently isn't in, so Akiyama leaves a pretty obvious message before leaving. Of course, Kanemura is hiding out in the back office, much to Kido's own surprise. He insists they deal with the Ueno Seiwa club crashers discreetly, without creating an incident between the families. Kido sees the system as something to follow and is upset someone isn't following the rules. We can tell he sees Akiyama as another misbehaving cog in the bigger machine the Tojo is a part of. Akiyama operates against loan office schemes, taking clients away from Yakuza-owned businesses, thus disrupting their extortionist practices. He seeks out the people at the bottom of the system to provide them with financial assistance. People like a third-string Yakuza family. Ironically, Akiyama's behavior benefits Kanemura Enterprises, and he happens to be in the right place at the right time. Araida. Arai, the soon-to-be new head of the Kanemura family, is headed to the club to deal with the problem. So Akiyama does what he does best, use the rules to his advantage to help someone else. <laughs> and everything goes according to plan.
Except that part. That was specifically not according to plan. The plan has failed. Ah, ah. It doesn't take long for the police to show up and immediately arrest Akiyama. He's free to go the next morning, but not before a warning from Detective Sugiyuchi. The general message here is clear. Akiyama has an advantage in this system. He has capital, lots of it. And he uses said capital to improve the lives of other people because he has a lot of experience being at rock bottom himself. Sugiyuchi's warning is as messed up a statement out of context as it is within. Don't help people move within the system. The ones at the bottom should stay at the bottom. <laughs> I want to point out how good of a plot advancement this is. They have their deep, meaningful exchange of ideals for the sake of theming, and then they drop the bombshell in a satisfying way to push the narrative forward. What great execution! Yakuza 4's minigames are better. The amount of bullshit Yakuza was letting players do at this point in the series was getting ridiculous. If Yakuza 3 was a dead giveaway about short development times ultimately hurting the quality of a project, Yakuza 4 was evidence of giving said project a little more time in the oven, vastly improving its outcome. An extra year of working with the same assets gave Mahjong special animations for calling winning hands. An extra year in the barrel doubled the amount of UFO catchers and gave each one different platform structures, forcing changes in strategies to collect prizes. An extra year gave us Boxelios 2. It was just like Boxelios 1, but it had 3D movement and it was legit. If Boxelios 2 had a son and they left the country for business, I would take care of their son. I would tell their son about how great a person Boxelios 2 was, and then I would shed tears thinking back on the life Boxelios 2 and I shared together, including, but not limited to, the day I gave birth to our child. Because Boxelios 2's son would also be my son. Because we were in love, and I begged Boxelios 2 to give me the business. And if you managed to make it to the final level of Boxelios 2, you unlocked Boxelios 1. Double the Boxelios for double the fun. A menage a trois where I'm getting Eiffel Towered by the Boxelios ships. Let's make it happen. And the slot machines were replaced with Pachinko! Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine, I guess. Whatever. They're more or less the same, except one is infinitely more interesting to look at. I'll take it. Golfing had improved ball physics, and the controls were remapped to allow for more precise shots. The batting cages had a greater variety of challenges between each difficulty. The hostess bars were given new animations, a special introduction visit to meet all the hostesses, and sometimes random requests from the women for food or drink. And not wanting to end the tradition of adding something new every time, Yamagasa 4 added sexy table tennis at a bathhouse. Because why not, I guess? Table tennis was about charging up your swing and then releasing at the right moment to rally the ball back at your opponent. Going back and forth for long enough would build heat, which would then allow you to activate a smash attack. Smashes were difficult to rally, making harder table tennis matches about rallying with perfect timing, forcing your opponent to dash from one side of the table to the other, and smashing after building heat. Oh, I get it. Sex. It was a welcome addition to Yakuza's cavalcade of fun, minus the weird sexual overtones. Okay, I get it, but I don't get it. Who's the guy in the office getting off on ping pong balls bouncing off a lady's chest? Whose grandpa is this for? <laughs> Meanwhile, at the funky, hip, and happening Tojo headquarters. Wow, you can tell the clan isn't doing too hot. Look at all these jobbers and captain positions. 
この金は一体何ですか東島会長マーダリング・イハラ、The Purple Suit from the Bar Incident has upset the relationship between the Tojo and the Ueno Seiwa Although we already know the Ueno Seiwa can in no way compare to the Tojo Daigo is looking to smooth things over They even bring out old man Shibata himself to grovel in front of Katsuragi Katsuragi appreciates the gifts. The stack of money, the big assertion, the Tojo and Ueno Seiwa are equals, the decaying third knuckle of a 50 year old man, but he asserts Ihara was something of a hero to his clan. So this. あなた方がチンピラ同士の喧嘩くらいに思っていたこの騒動実は上の聖和としては幹部組員を失うというとんでもない被害を受けているんですよ God, he is such an asshole! Daigo's offer isn't working, so he asks Katsuragi what he wants. He declares it's only fair to have Ihara's killer brought to justice, and if Marai has somehow gone missing, for the Ueno Seiwa to be given control of the lucrative Kamadocho Hills area, or a Tojo captain of equal value. So, that's Majima. Kashiwagi san no shigo, Hakuoka ya Nishiki Yamagumi to itta wakangashira hosa wa nakunatte shimatta. Past events had left the Tojo with a major power gap, and Daigo Dojima was losing his edge as a leader. He's been placed in a difficult position and is forced to use the Tojo's resources to search for Arai. Katsuragi obviously isn't acting on integrity in this interaction. He's gaming the system to gain something out of it at the expense of other people, going so far as to involve Majima, someone otherwise unrelated to the situation. We're watching the perspective of those in power. This is a negotiation between two top officials, treating their subordinates like goods to be compensated for, like children with baseball cards. Arai, Ihara, and Majima are spoken of in the same vein as Kamado Cho Hills. They are negotiating with human lives. Akiyama could use a break, but Kamado Cho is full of people in need of financial assistance. Sky Finance is <laughs> <laughs> this is Lily, and she has a tall order. A hundred million yen in ten days. With no guarantor and no collateral, it's sketchy, but before Akiyama can mull it over, she gets cold feet. He agrees to loan her the money if she can pass his test. She has three days to make three million yen at Elise, Akiyama's hostess club. それでもテストの方を受けてみますかはいやらせてください The next day the two meet to prepare her for the job They hit it off and grow closer and then kiss on the rooftop underneath the silvery moonlight But it's interrupted by the Shibata family Akiyama makes short work of them and decides to call it a night Lily and Akiyama's meeting was beat for beat classic detective novel storytelling the mysterious damsel enters the private detective's office while he's in between work and asks of him a staggering request. The private eye is skeptical, the damsel's response is short and fickle, and because the dick's curiosity is piqued, he insists on taking the case. This seems like a lot of information to sift through despite it only making up the first few hours of Yakuza 4, but the pacing of the narrative was remarkable when you consider the challenge of delivering one through multiple viewpoints. Their method was a no-brainer, dividing the content. In an interview with Gamasutra, lead director Jun Orihara put it simply, 
An important element of Yakuza 4 is that both the playstyles and the backstories of the protagonists impact the way they relate to their surroundings. The studio gave each playable character their own unique activities and barred them from others to help diversify what players would be doing at different points in the game. The plethora of sub-stories which used to swarm the map every chapter were grouped into exclusive chunks for each protagonist. Avoiding sub-stories meant avoiding some of the most memorable parts of the series, so most people would tell you they tried to play through as many as they could. In previous Yakuza's, we're talking about tens of hours in one chapter to get through all the sub-stories. This was a long time, and to be honest, really exhausting. Let's be real, how many different stories can you tell with Kiryu before you start asking yourself why he's being solicited to invest in Tuna? Yakuza 4 never lost the momentum it was trying to maintain and opened an opportunity to cater each sub-story towards each individual. With three other personalities to choose from, a broader range of scenarios were now possible. Stories unfitting for Kiryu to be a part of could now be told using the others. At an average of 16 sub-stories per character spread out among four chapters each, they were suddenly much more accessible and neatly organized into the gameplay loop. All the minigames and features we were used to were readily available playing as Akiyama. He was also in charge of scouting and managing the hostesses working for him. Hostess management hadn't changed much, but later on, other characters could visit Elise and meet the same hostesses Akiyama had trained. His sub-stories revolved around testing loan clients and rewarding those he judged good of character. <laughs> Akiyama wants to see people reach the success he has, and seeing them do it makes him happy. His faith in Arai is largely due in part to Arai saving his life when he was homeless, but also because he sees Arai as a strong enough leader to show the people of Kamurocho their dreams are possible. While Lily works at Elise, Akiyama goes off on another collection run, and coincidentally finds Drama Queen, the bar Lily previously worked at. Someone nearby explains Drama Queen is a Joso bar, and the owner specifically only hires Joso to run the place. I've got a bone to pick with whoever localized this section of the remaster, because whoever did actively undermined the efforts made by this remaster to be less offensive. Do you see this word? It's a word I, while writing this script for a stupid internet video, decided to research to ensure it wasn't offensive to use. Turns out it is. Don't use this word. This word is offensive. It's a bad word. You might remember me saying offensive content was removed from Yakuza 3's remaster in the last quest retrospective. It largely revolved around an insulting set of sub-stories involving a Joso, and a very bigoted Kiryu. The Japanese remaster redubbed Akiyama's lines relating to this word with the positive and acceptable word Joso, but the offensive term is still in the English localization of the remaster. Whoever was in charge of translating this didn't take into account the changes made specifically to remove this word from the narrative by the original writers. Its inclusion in the English remaster was not only disrespectful to the writers, but incredibly insulting to the people this word is used against and is an egregious lack of attention to the material they are working on. If I can educate myself and immediately figure this out on my own in less than 10 minutes, so can anyone else. This is someone doing a terrible job, and this needs to be patched out. Since Lily doesn't match the description, Akiyama figures it's worth taking a look inside, but the place is dead empty. <laughs> Nailed it. A brief investigation reveals the owner was a Shibata family member. The body's been here for a few days, so how does Lily own a fresh lighter from the establishment? Akiyama returns to Sky Finance to an unwelcome surprise. Hana-san! Hana-san! Please, please! 
Akito was kidnapped along with Sky Finance's transaction ledger. One big action sequence later, Akiyama interrogates the thieves and learns the Shibata family hired them to find Lily. With more questions than ever, Akiyama returns to his office to think things over. In time, Lily passes the test, and the two rendezvous at the top of Millennium Tower for a good old-fashioned femme fatale reveal. Our detective has put the pieces together, realizing the bodies of both Kanemura and the owner of Drama Queen were killed in similar ways. Lily couldn't have been working at Drama Queen for the obvious reasons. He makes the Shibata connection. The men from their date night were after Lily, not him. Then, he gives her a choice. If she tells him who she really is, she won't have to repay the loan. Why does this feel so... Casablanca? Lily disappears into the night, and Akiyama is pulled away by another phone call. Elise has an unexpected guest looking for Lily. And you thought my singing was bad. Minami has been sent by Majima to find Lily. When Akiyama refuses to tell him where she's gone, a fight ensues. He wipes the floor with Minami, and our favorite mad dog makes his oddly reserved entrance. Akiyama presses Majima for more information, intent on learning more. Yakuza 4 was creating an air of tension. A grizzled cop threatening the P.I. not to stick his nose where it doesn't belong. The fast love between him and the femme fatale. The intense exchange between two criminal ringleaders and the offer Daigo couldn't refuse. Akiyama was against the status quo. He was against keeping people in their struggle, against the idea of refusing to help someone trying to follow their dreams. He wasn't alone, but he was the only person using his opposition to the status quo to help others. When Arai broke the code of conduct, it was to put a bullet in a cornered man's head. When Katsuragi was manipulating the Yakuza's sense of honor, he was doing so at the expense of Ihata's life. Even worse yet, Daigo buckled under demands despite knowing Katsuragi was misusing the relationship between the clans to his advantage. But this was what Akiyama's story was about. Establishing those in power can abuse their power, and the people who could stand up to them don't, in fear of losing what power they have themselves. It isn't simply about going against the grain, but using those actions to better the lives of people around you, and protecting them from those at the top trying to keep them under heel. Akiyama didn't have a seat in the diet, but he had money, and new money made the world go round. He used it to help others break free of their place in the system. But even so, Akiyama was particular about whom he gave power to, and his fickleness would eventually come back to haunt him. Ooh, hey, who's this eight foot tall wall of handsome? Taijima, 
西島大河っちゅう男がこの登場会でどこまで登れるのかを How about you and me go someplace private and. Oh, oh my goodness! Holy shit! Whoa, hey, come on! Oh, this is just too long! Oh, man, this is horrifying! Koremo. Oya ji ga tenka t o r d o m e Ueno san. Sajima's story was an old school prison break movie with opening text crawl, a transfer to an Okinawan prison island, and your obligatory, hey, you the guy who killed our boss on the outside, scene to establish his raw badassery. The big guy has resigned himself to death row, believing his actions have helped his boss, the patriarch of the Sasai family, ascend the Tojo ranks. He's a product of the Yakuza. A young kid adopted by Sasai and brought up to be one of his enforcers. His rampage 25 years ago was a service to the man he was indentured to. It's a complicated weight he's forced to live with until someone we recognize updates him on the outside world. What's great about Saijima is he's a straightforward person. No nonsense, no hesitation. Nothing poses a challenge for a man named Taiga the size of a Taiga with the ferociousness of one to boot. Elegant, beautiful, efficient. Saijima and Hamazaki work together to break out, and we catch a glimpse of Yakuza 3's compassion finally paying off. The two get separated in their escape, and by separated, I mean. Hamazaki! Yeah. Luckily for Saijima, Hope finds him washed up on her doorstep. And then the coolest thing happens. Oh my god, it's happening. それまでは誰も信用できへんなるほどな Oh my god, this is totally happening Yeah! We knew Kiryu was going to be one of the playable characters, but the real twist was his introduction as an integral boss fight. His moveset was entirely intact, like staring into a mirror for veteran fans, and it made a great comparison between Saijima and Kiryu's strength. <laughs> The search for truth is what drives Saijima forward, to learn what happened those 25 years ago after he turned himself in. Despite the initial doubt, it's a goal the Dragon of Dojima respects. <laughs> With Kiryu's assistance, Saijima arrives in Kamurocho, eager to find Sasai. Saijima's prison escape is the moment he refuses to play by the rules he's accepted his entire life. It's when his actions begin to yield positive results, and it isn't given to him. Fighting Kiryu was more than cool fan service. The perspective we've played every other Yakuza game with was being challenged. Kiryu's misunderstanding of how the world worked was our misunderstanding of how the world worked. The people in power who could supply Saijima with the truth refused to. So Saijima's decision is one made backed into a corner, and he earns every step of his journey back to Kamurocho. A side-by-side -side comparison showcases how staggering a difference an extra year working with the same space can improve an overall aesthetic. More detailed and populated signage and narrower buildings gave Kamurocho a dense, commercialized feel with hundreds of businesses and homes stacked onto one another. 
Noticeably higher resolutions on textures prioritized the aggression of the city's marketing, and an equally aggressive lighting change casted harsh shadows from the lights of colorful ads over their target audience. NPC density in Yakuza 3 was a way to distract from noticeable imperfections or plain environmental details. This overcrowding was reduced in Yakuza 4 so the city could become the subject of our attention. Yakuza 4 took place exclusively within Kamado Cho's seductive alleys. Surprising considering the last two entries made efforts to include locations outside of Tokyo. The lessons learned in Sotenbori and Ryukyu paid off. They couldn't build Kamado Cho outward or drastically alter its roads, but they could build it higher and lower. And even lower than that. And maybe through it in some cases. Rooftops, sewers, an underground mall section, and even a little Asia district were added to Kamado Cho. These provided an alternate means of navigating the city, and created new spaces for additional shops and substories. As we shifted from one character to the next, so did Kamado Cho's shape. Routes through the city changed depending on who we were controlling. We took to the rooftops with Akiyama, and then incorporated the roofs and the sewers into Saijima's police evading movement. He eventually meets Kido, and through him, the florist, an underground informant who's been helping Kiryu out since the original Yakuza. The florist agrees to locate Sasai for Saijima if he participates in a death match within the underground Colosseum. Saijima mops the floor with the guy, and with his exhausted victim lying on the floor, the crowd demands the blood they paid to see. <laughs> But, the Tiger of Sasai has had enough. He leaves the crowd silent. Knowing Saijima's true character, the florist gives him what he's looking for, though it's not what he was expecting. It's a bit goofy hearing this yoked Olympian man talk about the horrors of taking a life inside an underground coliseum full of rich folks paying money to see a bloodbath. The scene isn't so much about the setting as it is the subjects. Saijima is a victim of the system. His debt to a man with power led to his eventual indenturement to the machine. The hit he carries out on a rival Yakuza family is a desperate attempt to make good on his debts. The Yakuza were the only option Saijima had left to make any difference in his life, so he followed orders. He did what the system told him to do. Then the system forgot about him. The system shipped him to an unmarked prison where he was treated like an animal, and when he finally left the prison and returned to the system, it demanded him to perform. A crowd of rich so-and-sos asking a poor man to kill for their entertainment is a crowd of cannibals, getting off on the idea of people below them performing degrading acts. They are the ones in power using people like Saijima as scapegoats for their twisted desires. And despite everything Saijima had done, Sasai became a frail broken man, and both their names were forgotten by the Tojo clan. His story represents the futility of working your way up through a system designed to oppress you of what you represent to the people up top, of the purpose such a system has intended for you. Saijima had spent his entire life working for the benefit of an establishment designed to keep him at the bottom, believing it would eventually care about him. As he worked against it to improve his well-being, he was met with the most resistance, but also the most progress. Now he was on the run, and he was taking you along for the ride. If Saijima came too close to a police officer, a chase sequence would begin. Chase sequences had a few new bells and whistles. Quick turns gave you a speed boost and a 90 degree pivot to instantly round a corner, alleviating the jank of trying to outrun someone in tight spaces. Throwable objects were another option to lower your prey stamina with well-timed throws. Enemies could use these objects too, preventing easier chases from being too non-interactive. 
Closing the distance wasn't always safe anymore. A special heat move could be performed by the person being chased, which could knock the pursuer down and reduce their stamina drastically. But if countered, the pursuer could return a volley of kicks, usually damaging enough to end the chase completely. Again, Yakuza 4 took the somewhat dry aspects of Yakuza 3 and gave them more to do. Chase sequences went from an inflatable obstacle course to a round of Ninja Warrior by comparison, avoiding environmental obstacles while dodging projectiles and sometimes even multiple pursuers. It wasn't simply a difference in polish, there was more creativity involved. More enthusiasm in considering how these smaller elements could contribute to a larger chunk of gameplay. This enthusiasm added depth to smaller interactions and established the pace players would encounter them. Saejima didn't sing. Saejima didn't understand the point of hostess bars. Saejima couldn't be seen in public places. Instead, Saejima gave players access to Purgatory, the Underground Coliseum, and a dojo where he could train apprentices in becoming the ultimate fighters. Apprentice training was an old-school tycoon simulation. You had 50 turns with each apprentice to train them with the goal of winning one of the Coliseum's tournaments. You were in charge of their daily training regimen, could take them out for drinks to raise their motivation, and have them participate in exhibition matches in order to win prize money for the dojo's upgrades. Each apprentice had different strengths and focuses, and while you couldn't control them during a match, you could cheer them on and call for a finishing move. It was a fun departure from the usual glam Yakuza tried to include in all of its distractions, and had a full storyline dedicated to it. Apprentices interacted with one another, and the dojo itself became more popular the more successful Saejima's efforts were. It showed off Saejima's true nature, a patient teacher, of strong character but few words, blunt but endearingly so. The more you learned about Saejima, the more you began to understand he wasn't the violent person others made him out to be. Minami is waiting for Saejima when he returns to his hideout. He tells him to head to the Millennium Tower if he wants answers. Once there, Majima himself exits the elevator hallway and escorts his sworn brother to the batting cages where Saejima demands answers. The confrontation eventually goes the way you'd expect. Majima. Technically, Majima loses, but it's more of a soft tie. They reconcile, and Saejima asks Majima about his eye. We're taken through a flashback sequence and learn why Majima never showed to back Saejima up. Majima-san, today's attack. In calling off the hit, the Shibata family left Saejima to take the fall, acting out as a lone gunman instead of on behalf of the family. Shibata keeps Majima occupied inside the warehouse to prevent his interference with the plan, where he's eventually subdued and, well, Saejima and Majima's reunion was a staggering comparison between the two lives they ended up living. Majima rose through the Tojo ranks, owned one of the largest Tojo families, and possessed its greatest asset, the Kamurocho Hills area. Even so, he had lost a great deal in the process the ones he loved, and a part of his identity. Although Majima definitely had privilege Saejima could never dream of having, it was only given to him after subjugation and punishment unjustly enforced upon him. He was forced to bear the consequences of actions carried out by others against his will. 
Sajima's forgiveness is their reconciliation, and his acknowledgement of how the system, regardless of where it placed the two, did so for the benefit of those in greater power. <laughs> He was certain of one thing. The facts surrounding his incarceration were suspect, and someone was getting rid of everyone who knew the truth. His initial anger was pointed at Majima, but he corrected its direction to the source of both their problems the people pulling their strings. Together, they had more power than they did acting alone. But would it be enough to take on the Tojo, and now the criminal justice system looking to put Saijima back behind bars? Time would tell, but one thing was clear. Neither Majima nor Saijima were done making sacrifices. Masayoshi Tanamura is a police officer in the Community Safety Division with a tendency to go against the department's interests and a really bad gambling problem. The department has a hard time keeping Tanamura under control. He's got a pension for shaking down illegal businesses, but the money goes to services providing aid to the undocumented workers being taken advantage of by those businesses. The department calls him the parasite of Kamado Cho, a none too subtle nod at his loyalty to the city's immigrants. Tanamura's reason for joining the force is to find his father's killer. 25 years ago, he was murdered during his investigation of the Saijima case, leaving behind notes hinting at a possible cover-up. As fate would have it, a lead about the Shibata family pays off. His meeting with Yasuko is cut short when she's kidnapped by Shibata thugs. Tanamura chases them through the Kamadocho docks, expecting to find Shibata himself. Unfortunately, his lead is about to hit a dead end. <laughs> he takes Yasuko back to Little Asia. He eventually convinces her to tell him about the killings, the purpose of the 100 million yen, and about Katsuragi's extortion. <laughs> Tanamura uses her phone to set up a meeting with Katsuragi, and afterwards, Yasuko leaves Kamado Cho to head to Okinawa, where she believes Saijima is still imprisoned. When they meet, Katsuragi tells Tanamura about his plans, and... あの襲撃事件に柴田、そして、and at least they're not sitting on a couch this time. That's 
Tanamura was left with two other leads, Mishima, the surviving Uenosewa Yakuza from The Night at the Bar, and the original owner of the 100 million yen. Huh? Akiyama gets caught up to speed on things, about Arai killing Shibata, about Katsuragi's 25-year-old scheme and his manipulation of Yasuko. The two have a satisfying back and forth I'd expect out of a Sherlock Holmes story. The rookie beat cop and the weathered private eye, brainstorming to discover the motive. It's like Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson in the Batcave, except Batman's a chain smoker and Robin's actor was recasted due to drug abuse allegations. Tanamura is a complicated character. He's what many would, at face value, call a good cop. Helps the downtrodden, understands the complicated situations those people are in, and takes every opportunity to harass the people taking advantage of them. Portrayed as an outcast, causing trouble and sticking his nose in business he should stay out of. But he's confident he can hold those responsible accountable for their actions, even if they're a part of the police department. Yet, Tanamura is more than aware of the department's corruption. Tanamura works alone. Tanamura trusts none of his peers. Despite that, he still believes he can carry out justice within the corruption of the police department. Akiyama can move freely within the system, Saijima is a victim of the system, and Tanamura begins as a believer of its mechanisms, just not who's operating them. Meeting Akiyama convinces Tanamura to start questioning his beliefs. Akiyama is the one who convinces him to keep his other lead to himself. He points out Tanamura is clearly suspicious of his superiors, and their deliberation connects the shooting at the Shibata-owned nightclub to the Saijima incident from 25 years ago. Meaning, if Tanamura's assumption is correct about a police cover-up, calling in his meeting with Mishima would be certifying his death. But Tanamura stays on the path, insistent on doing things the way he believes is right. And although he's beginning to get doubtful, he's hell-bent on solving the case. Now, things get interesting. Akiyama sets the stage and discovers the mystery. Saijima is the mystery's victim. While playing as them, the pacing was relatively slow. Tensions weren't high, people weren't in immediate danger, the pieces were still being moved into place. Hostess management and apprentice training reflect this pacing. Two slow-moving activities to invest time into without feeling a sense of urgency to proceed with the next story objective. But Tanamura was chasing answers to a decades-old murder case and coming across them fast. Tanamura was busy. It wouldn't have made sense for him to fall into a subplot about, I don't know, parking tickets or something. And maybe at some point the king of parking violations would challenge him to a boxcar race. What, 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 what do you want me to say? It's a Yakuza game, of course he would. Instead, Tanamura carried around a police scanner and worked with the city's community watch. Every so often, the police scanner would go off, reporting a crime or civil disturbance. These crimes weren't set in any specific location, they were proximity-based and procedural, meaning at no point were you too far from a disturbance or compulsively sweeping every street in Kamado Cho for them to activate. They conveniently occurred alongside any sub-stories or main quest objectives, resulting in their own sub-story unfolding simultaneously alongside other narratives, some which required responding to disturbances in order to advance them. The police scanner gave a sense of urgency to everything players did as Tanamura, and helped emphasize the rising action of the narrative. And it highlighted how much tighter the storytelling was in Yakuza 4 compared to 3. 
and maybe even one in two. The more I tried to trim the fat out of the narrative for this episode, the more I realized how little there was to discard. Yakuza 3 definitely had fluff you could ignore. It's easy to point at elements we could consider too much or, for lack of better phrasing, too irrelevant. Yakuza 3 continuously reinforced Kiryu's love for the orphanage kids every five or so hours, and it was unnecessary. Rikia constantly begged Kiryu to let him stick around periodically. It was repetitive. You could do your taxes during the armchair exposition and still have time for a solid nap, or to turn it into a total bop of an intermission. In Yakuza 4, the situation was different. Because we had a shifting perspective, the information we learned was always relevant to our interests as the player and to the main plot. Akiyama's interest in Yasuko tied him to the mystery and returned as an effective motive for him to help Tanimura. Saijima's bout in the underground coliseum reintroduced the florist into the world Yakuza 4 was re-establishing, but it also painted Purgatory, a place previously thought fondly of, as the real den of terrible people it's supposed to be. Even the exposition-heavy scenes, though certainly long in the tooth, were focused on specific questions relevant to the story at the point they're discussed. It wasn't wasteful. Every part of Yakuza 4's narrative held a purpose. Tanamura heads down to the docks to meet with Mishima, and it goes south pretty quickly. <laughs> Sugiuchi doesn't surprise Tanamura, however. You see, it's all in those shoes! What kind of beat cop goes around wearing expensive immaculate shoes to a crime scene? And how the heck did Sugiuchi know to save Tanamura at just the right moment? Okay, so maybe it's not just the shoes. This is supposed to be Tanamura's day in the sun, but instead he learns a difficult truth. He's right. Sugiuchi is protected because he's a police officer. None of the other officers in this warehouse truly have the power to stop him without risking their own careers and more. <laughs> There's a chase scene, and Sugiuchi finally reveals himself as Tanamura's father's killer. They fight a little bit, as a treat, and Tanamura demands answers. <laughs> Sugiuchi reveals he joined the police force as a spy for the Yakuza. He and Katsuragi are also sworn brothers. We return to the day of the incident. As Saijima walks out of the bar none the wiser, Katsuragi stirs from his shock, as do a few of his fellow family members. It was a setup the whole time! We done been bamboozled! Sugiuchi shot Katsuragi in the shoulder to make it believable and went off to file his pretty police report covering it all up. I know, I know. How would whoever reviewing the crime scene not realize the bullet holes in the suits not matching the cause of death, or the presence of rubber bullets in addition to real bullets, or the lethal blows being fired from a different weapon than the ones the killer used? Have no worries! Because the narrative is totally aware this is a crappy cover-up. Uri ga ari sugiru yo, Sugiuchi-kun. 
Deputy Commissioner Munakata was an eagle-eyed detective and ripped Sugiuchi's reports to shreds. He pointed out all the inconsistencies, the deaths, the rubber bullets the killer somehow got their hands on despite being experimental rounds made by the police department themselves. How the hell did these two bozos think this was going to work? With Sugiuchi cornered and the whole case cracked wide open, Munakata made the move to arrest the real killers, right? Is anyone surprised? Anyone? Date? Thank you, Date. Tanamura's story was focused on the enforcement of the rules, the false dichotomy of good and bad, and the problem with trying to change systemic issues while enforcing them. He's met with constant resistance and eventually discovers the resistance is the problem itself. He learned exactly how much good a good cop can actually do. Chances are when you've got bad cops at the bottom getting away with what they're doing, it's because there's bad cops at the top signing off on it. The flaws in the criminal justice system allow those who uphold it to abuse it for personal gain. If they can control the information, they can do whatever they want. In other words, there's no such thing as a good cop if they can't stop the bad ones without suffering dire consequences. There's no accountability, and if a bad cop wanted to come clean, well... <laughs> Now they're a liability to the status quo. Sugiuchi turning out to be a Yakuza is a subtle way of saying the difference between a Yakuza and a police officer is the size of the badge. Saijima's prison sentence captured the brutality of the police force. Tanamura debunked the misconceptions of police officers. One revelation after another preventing good intentioned police officers from solving internal issues and showcasing how the system protects corrupt enforcers from persecution. Tanamura had an enormous challenge ahead if he wanted to apprehend the deputy commissioner, even with Akiyama's help. His sense of justice was intact, but it didn't matter. Who could he even report to? It was going to take a different approach. He had to change his perspective. And luckily for him, the winds of change were once again blowing in Kamado Cho's direction. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 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 It seems everybody in the Yakuza universe lacks peripheral vision. Can't you see there's a half-dead guy standing in your lawn? What? I thought it was funny. Kiryu tells Hamazaki he should turn himself back in and mentions Saijima made it to the orphanage and headed to Kamado Cho. Hamazaki's clearly happy about it, and all the compassion and trust we talked about in Yakuza 3 is about to be paid forward. He tells Kiryu about Saijima, about the secret prison used to extort Yakuza in exchange for humane treatment, and about the suspicious cover-up. He asks him to return to Kamado Cho in order to help Saijima, but Kiryu's hesitant. Hamazaki pulls out a ledger he snuck out of the prison, showing the transactions going in and out of the penitentiary with an interesting amount coming from a certain dead politician. そうだ。今から 
Oh damn, it's all connected! The 10 billion yen from the original Yakuza was being used to fund the secret prison. Kiryu still isn't convinced. There's gotta be more to it if Hamazaki wants his help. <laughs> Aw oh, man, someone scribbled their grocery list inside the ledger. I expected more professionalism from corrupt state officials. Munakata plans to get the Tojo to heal under his power in order to have complete control over crime with the intent to commodify it. The Tojo clan is in danger once again and Kiryu is compelled back to Kamado Cho. They take Hamasaki to the precinct because he wants to turn himself in, and they meet Yasuko, who's looking for Saijima but obviously not getting answers from the police. They exchange information, agree to head back to Kamado Cho, and are ambushed by the prison wardens. Kiryu beats their faces in, and Hamazaki stays behind to take the heat for resisting arrest. The reason people hold Yakuza 4's narrative in such little regard is because it was challenging an opinion you've had since Yakuza 1. Of course, the knee-jerk reaction is to cock an eyebrow and call it convoluted nonsense. It was asking you to change your perspective, for Kiryu to change his, and it made sure you were both listening. Yakuza 4 revisited the ending of its predecessor and swapped the character roles to prove a big point. For all the good he does others, Kiryu isn't proactive. Hamazaki rolls up to the place, and despite all the begging, Kiryu hesitates to involve himself until he spells it out for him. Hamazaki shows how far one can truly take their compassion. Once he realizes the situation Saijima is in, he stops acting for himself almost immediately. He didn't need a whole lot of convincing, unlike a certain dragon of Dojima whom we personally know tends to require a great deal of it. This is a different reaction to seeing Kamado Cho than Kiryu's accustomed to having. With new context to the world around him, he's seeing the city through different eyes, and he's realizing it's not entirely the city he thought it was. What's great about Kiryu having a smaller story segment to grow inside of is the ability to give the character growth without it being in large quantity. Kiryu was more or less solved, but they could do something small with him. They could separate the player from Kiryu, and in doing so, have us observe him without projecting ourselves onto him. Compounded by rebuilding the world through individuals who had different struggles and lives, the result was noticing flaws in someone we thought did everything right. By making us look at Kiryu from the outside in, we were made to observe ourselves. And if Kiryu could be wrong, so could we. His section followed through with Tanamura's faster pacing, totally foregoing any standout unique activity, instead integrating a substory into exploration by giving him unique, random enemy encounters. As Kiryu, players fought members of different gangs instead of random Kamado Cho NPCs. If he fought enough of them, they'd reveal their leader's location, unlocking a mini-boss and an opportunity to dismantle the gang. When one gang was beaten, another took its place, advancing a chain of sub-stories about each leader, eventually leading Kiryu to the mysterious foe inciting the gangs. We were getting close to the grand finale. Yakuza 4 began to funnel down to its core elements in order to maintain the impending climax of the story. Kiryu makes the obvious decision to enlist Majima's help in saving the Tojo. <laughs> Majima tells Kiryu he's their only hope before he's taken away and the scene transitions to a frustrated Daigo, Munakata, and Arai. We're watching the bigger fish eat the smaller one. Munakata promises Daigo the removal of the Ueno Seiwa and the Tojo clan's safety if 
he promotes Arai to Tojo captain and allows him to act as liaison for the police department and manage the Tojo's operations. Daigo assumes Katsuragi has some sort of bargaining chip up his sleeve to prevent the deputy commissioner from eliminating the UNO Seiwa, and he does. <laughs> the big guy is pretty upset about getting captured. He tries to press for more information, but gets nothing useful before discovering who sold him out to Katsuragi. Sky Finance no Kakushi Kinko ni atta genkin seok. Buji, go dat ni seiko shimashita. Omae wa. O isashiuri desu, Saejima san. Oof, this is starting to get complicated, isn't it? Kind of crazy how all these people with power keep trying to take advantage of each other by using all these other people with next to nothing as sacrificial pawns in their schemes. It's almost like Kido and Arai shifting allegiances is an example of how those less fortunate are easy to manipulate into doing terrible things for promises of wealth or power they may never be rewarded with. I wonder if there's a much older character to compare them to in order to represent how ingrained into our society this practice is. Oh. Oh yeah. He's right there. Majima's arrest confirms our assumption about his success being convenient for those in power. Daigo obviously isn't about to hand the Tojo over to Munakata. He sells Majima out in order to maintain his position in the political battle he's having. The moment it becomes beneficial to those above him, Majima has everything taken away from him, and it's taken away from the people who need him the most. It's important to understand Daigo's rise to chairman in the first place. He didn't necessarily earn it. He inherited the chairman title because his mother was acting chairman and she held the position because she was the highest ranked member of the clan after what happened in Yakuza 1. Daigo didn't come from nothing. His success in the system was already guaranteed before he was born. And because of this, his view of the Tojo is somewhat detached from his view of its members. To protect his status, Daigo chooses the structure over the people inside it. Kiryu runs back to Serena where Yasuko should be waiting, but she's run off with Akiyama and Tanamura, whom he mistakes for kidnappers. He chases them into the sewers towards purgatory. Akiyama and Tanamura tell Yasuko to keep running, and naturally, this happens. <laughs> They agree to disagree with their fists. Kiryu takes down Akiyama and Tanamura at the same time and runs off to purgatory, but Katsuragi's already gone. Anaya. They reconvene at Serena, Tanamura meets Date, and Akiyama has a bad time. He explains Kido probably learned about the office's vault the same day he was kidnapped. Kiryu shows them the ledger, enough leverage to trade out for their friends' safety. Katsuragi agrees to the exchange at the top of Kamurocho Hills on one condition. Kiryu comes alone and fights through the entirety of the Ueno Seiwa clan. In this way, even if he makes it to the top, he'd be too tired to kill Katsuragi even if he wanted to. <laughs> This man has been cruising for a bruising since the day he slid out the baby tunnel. With all the sabotage and double-crossing going on, there's no reason for either of these two parties to trust anyone. 
Kiryu just finished learning about a secret prison and a cover-up. Tanamura is assumed dead by the police department and trying not to blow his cover, and Akiyama's had his faith in Arai obliterated. All three of these individuals have had the rug swept out from under them, and they're not about to let it happen again so soon. It's a perfect example of how easy it is for the system they're a part of to turn its people against each other instead of focusing on their mutual problem. And it works. Because while they're fighting, Katsuragi gets away with both Saijima and Yasuko, leaving the three with a new problem to deal with. Fortunately, when you need to topple an entire clan of Yakuza, one dragon of Dojima is plenty. Kiryu steps into the Kamado Cho Hills area, ready to do what he does best. Fucking somebody up! Four fighters meant four fighting styles. Akiyama specialized in rushing down opponents with viciously long kick combos, a great opener for new players and those returning to dish out fast damage and feel unstoppable. Saijima was a charge character waiting for an opening to deal tons of damage with swift, devastating blows. Tanamura was a master at dealing with multiple enemies, using parries to shove enemies into walls or single them out from the bigger group, and grappling moves to force them into submission. Kiryu was a destructive force, utilizing his weapon mastery, powerful counters, and huge array of versatile heat moves as well as his unique red heat mode to dispatch any opponent. Each had a set of weapons they could utilize, with shared weapons being used differently. Each had their own set of heat moves with different contexts to activate. Saijima had a particularly nasty one, requiring you to use heat as an enemy is bouncing off the ground from one of his attacks. Tanamura's heat moves relied on bouncing enemies off walls or getting them into the grappled stance. This variety was the rock-solid core of what made fighting so enjoyable, only made better by the new skill system. Each character had their own set of skills to learn, but there were no level restrictions, only skills requiring prerequisites before unlocking them. You'd gain three skill orbs at every level, which you could use to unlock skills in any order you wanted. If you weren't big on heat moves, you didn't have to spend points on unlocking them. If you wanted all the passive abilities first, you could have them. If you didn't want to level up at all and do a no levels challenge run, you could do it. A short level cap for each fighter meant players would gain a ton of skill orbs at the start of each storyline, empowering the player as they jumped from one part of the story to the next, eliminating the sense they were starting from scratch each time. Returning players could make beelines towards abilities they knew they wanted and everybody could personalize each fighter to their own preferences. Enemies in Yakuza never got any stronger, but now they didn't need to. The difficulty curve became based on how well you could adapt to fighting enemies as different people and how receptive you were to the strengths of others besides Kiryu. His superiority as a fighter served as a late game build, but returning to his movesets, especially after having to fight said moveset earlier, put into perspective how different Kiryu was and how specific Kiryu was to the world around him. Kiryu storms the Kamado Cho Hills Tower, reaching the rooftop after decimating the entire Ueno Seiwa. Katsuragi's waiting with hostages in tow. Ooh, you are such a rude bastard! I love it! Katsuragi's determined to be a two-faced liar to the very end, but Kiryu's not having it. He's focused on getting the deal over and done with, pretty standard for the dragon's modus operandi. Show up, solve the problem, go home, get chewed out by your daughter, cry yourself to sleep. They start the exchange with Yasuko, Katsuragi declaring he'll leave Saijima and the money with Kiryu once he confirms the contents in the ledger. But he's a big stinky liar who tells Kido to shoot them once he's in possession of it.
Kido lowers the lift to reveal he was working with Arai the entire time. Or was he? Arai introduces himself to Kiryu, telling him it's an honor to finally meet him. After watching Rikia pass away in his arms, seeing someone totally disregard their anarchy is the easiest way to get on his bad side. Kiryu swears to stop Arai and makes it clear he won't let the Tojo be taken, but Arai hits him with some cold hard facts, something Kiryu has no response for. This little squint Kiryu makes is an acceptance of what Arai is saying, because it's true. He's always too late. Yasuko frees Saijima, who immediately rushes over to Katsuragi. He flips him over and correctly assumes Katsuragi's wearing a bulletproof vest. Katsuragi tries to egg him on, but Saijima refuses to give in to his remarks. As he walks away, showing mercy to the man who ruined his entire life, a shot rings out. And then another. <laughs> Yasuko gives her life to save Saijima's, and uses what little time she has left to free him of his burdens. She slowly moves towards Katsuragi, confronting, unwavering. When you think he's already lost everything, Saijima loses the most important person in his life. Katsuragi's unflinching demeanor in the face of being held accountable for his deeds deteriorates the moment his life is truly in danger. When those in power are confronted with the consequences of their actions, they're remorseless. They lie because it's convenient. They don't care how their actions affect others, so people get hurt. People die in the process, leaving the ones who survive them broken and malleable. The minute you turn your back on them or show them forgiveness, they will take advantage of it. These are the traits of a coward. For someone who claimed to care about the Tojo and the people of Kamado Cho, it took a lot to get Kiryu to act. He never showed up to solve a problem early on or check in with the people he claimed to care so much about. He was always late to the conflict, and in the meantime, his friends were in danger. Or worse. And after he was satiated with helping, Kiryu would leave again and allow the problem to continue growing in his absence, sometimes as a direct consequence of his actions. Arai was right, and Kiryu had to accept it. He had to accept he was part of the problem. Kiryu's story was a lesson in what it means to help the people struggling around you. It requires compassion and trust but it also needs consistency. It needs you to be proactive, to be present before people are in immediate danger. 
If you wait until a problem grows to boiling point, solving it won't make everything magically better. Hesitating will inevitably conflate multiple issues into a larger one. You can't just pop in when you feel like it and then walk away once you've done a couple of things. People still have to live with those problems when you stop paying attention. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it isn't happening. You should care about the way you act too, because someone impressionable might get the wrong idea. Kido's suit being remarkably close to Kiryu's outfit was intentional. This was the example the Dragon of Dojima had been setting. This idea of being the next king of the jungle, of being the toughest, strongest person in Kamado Cho. It wasn't who Kiryu really was or what he stood for, but it didn't matter. Kiryu wasn't setting the right example whether or not he intended to. The Dragon of Dojima had to accept he had failed to be an ally to those who needed him. He had to walk through the city and realize for every bit of good he did, he had allowed a lot of bad. But he still held status. He had power, others didn't. The dragon had brought the winds of change back to Kamado Cho, but would they last long enough to make a difference? It was up for Kiryu to decide. Munakata's indifferent about Arai letting Kido live with a flesh wound. He's more concerned about Arai letting a hundred billion yen fall back into the hands of our heroes and how he can turn them against each other. But unlike Munakata, even Arai has a line he won't cross. もうこれ以上あなたの指示には従えません。アライ。私にも極道としていや、警察官としての信念がありますから。Ah, huh. well, convenient. I was getting tired of kidnappings, to be honest. Akiyama has his money back, but he's lost his confidence, his confidants, and the woman he loved. His vault is full, but his heart is empty. The 100 billion yen sitting in front of him no longer reflects who he thought he was, this quirky philanthropist who's a hero to the people. In truth, Akiyama is picky. He's very specific about who he lends money to, and he makes people jump through hoops in order to earn his good graces. Haruka calls Kiryu to let him know Hamazaki has passed away. He silently accepts his actions as an individual haven't been enough. His skepticism of Saijima, his insistence on attempting to reason with Katsuragi despite Katsuragi's proven lack of integrity, and his lack of diligence have resulted in a situation far worse than he anticipated. And now people are suffering. People are dead when they shouldn't be. Tanamura wrestles with his inability to remedy the situation and his naivety. His entire belief in the justice system had shattered, and it wasn't exactly a good opinion to begin with. His participation as a police officer contributed to the power Munakata has, and his investigation led the corrupt department straight to the doorstep of every potential witness and suspect. Saijima... <sighs> Saijima has lost everything. His loved ones, his future, and his freedom after years of serving time for a crime he never committed, and he was losing hope. His willpower was dwindling, there seemed to be little left to care about, and it's especially those moments when people struggling need to know you care the most. Kiryu tells Saijima about Hamazaki's last words, a request from him to them. Kiryu 
Kodai. And finally, he admits the flaws in his own responsibilities. Tanamura and Akiyama join them. いろんな人間の夢を叶えるためにな。そうだ。俺らはまだやらなきゃならないことがあるんだ。ボスザルは猿山にいてこそふさわしい。ゴニルゼインまだやり残してることがあるんじゃないですかね。Akiyama has a genius plan. Take all of his money to the top of Millennium Tower and just kind of wait and see who shows up. They don't know who the ringleader is, but by setting a trap using the money everyone seems so interested in as bait, they'll snag whoever it is in it. Before the plan goes into motion, the four hold a funeral for the person they've failed to protect. An apology for not being there sooner, and a silent vow to ensure it never happens again. And then, they go on the offensive. They were expecting a ringleader, but there isn't any one person you can make go away for things to be better. A systemic issue is a widespread issue. ジャック体化した組織直系百団体三万二もの人間を動かしていくことがどんなことなのかお前にわかるのか誰かが犠牲になってでも組織の基盤を再構築する必要があるんだ。Daigo forgets a governing body is nothing without being able to protect its people. He's lost sight of what matters in the grand scheme of things and believes a few sacrifices are necessary. Using the money to restructure the Tojo saves Daigo's seat of power, not the families he claims to be protecting. Arai has his concept of justice ruined by Munakata's machinations and by his undercover work as a Yakuza in the Tojo. His shaky allegiances reveal his inability to work with others and his brand of justice has already proven to be detrimental to innocent people. He's misappropriating justice to gain executive power. <laughs> Shujuyu 
Monokata claims human beings are designed to be manipulated and used in service of the strong. He has no need for the system to change, he likes it just the way it is, and he'll do anything to ensure those pushed down continue to be. Kido has nothing to say in this situation, but Kido has never had a say in his own agency. Working for Daigo, working with Arai, with Katsuragi, with Kanemura, Kido is swept up in the schemes of others and becomes enamored with the association. He may be a victim in the machine, but he's complicit. He idolizes those in power, he acts in service to them, and therefore must be held accountable despite his place in the machine. As Munakata orders his men to ready their weapons, Akiyama's plan goes into action. All this talk about money and where it's going, man, fuck your money. So, Akiyama learns you can't pick and choose who's worth helping. If you're going to help those in need, you do it without prejudice. No one is above reproach, and no one gets to decide right from wrong on their own. Saijima decides he can never give up, no matter what happens. His fight against Kido is a tragic one. Two people with the same struggle made enemies by the powers that be. Kiryu is ready to right his wrongs. No more turning a blind eye to what's going on. For privilege is power, and power doesn't come without responsibility. A lesson he intends to pass on to Daigo. Tanamura has had enough of being an extension of the machine. The power of authority is useless when the people who outrank you abuse it. Holding on to it will reinforce the argument that such authority should exist in the first place. So he does the only thing anyone with authority should do when they learn the problem is authority itself. Munakata questions what Tanamura could possibly do against this many police officers. His answer is simple. He's not alone. Munakata-san, Four of them defeat each of their opponents, ending with Tanamura's victory over Munakata. With nowhere left to run and no one else to hide behind, Munakata pleads with Daigo to do something. Tanamura pulls out his gun and gives him a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> A 
Arai steps in and explains to Munakata why Tanamura doesn't just shoot him. あなたが乗し上がるためにあなたは死ぬべきじゃないあなたが利用してきた刑務所の中で一生この罪を償ってください私も一緒にお付き合いします at last, Arai, Daigo, and Kido, I guess, honestly, the message starts to get a little muddy here, begin to hold themselves accountable, leaving one stubborn old man to dig his heels into the sand. He's right. The police would never allow it to go public and risk their own credibility, which is why you don't go to the people upholding the system when you want to change it. When something isn't right, you inform as many people as possible about what's going on. In true Akiyama fashion, if the system won't work for you, then work against the system. This checkmate upsets Munakata greatly, and he makes a last ditch effort to abuse his power. <laughs> Except everything's fine. Uh, Notice how many outs Munakata is being given here. At the amount of grace being given him despite his actions and his continued aggression towards the people he's admitted to using for his personal gain. No matter what he does, the group is intent on seeking proper justice, but when demanded to acknowledge crimes against those they rule over, those in power will refuse until the bitter end. Although it ends on an optimistic note, Yakuza 4 is pretty frank about routing systemic injustice and protecting innocent lives. Life goes on, whether or not you succeed. But that doesn't mean you should stop trying. Every day, someone's life is about to irrevocably change because of some higher-end decision made to satisfy a handful of people who are out of touch with the rest of the world. While you may never see it happen, people get hurt. But it doesn't have to be that way, it doesn't have to go unnoticed, it doesn't have to be invisible. Anyone can help. You can give a little for someone else to have a little. You can hold yourself accountable for your part in enabling injustices. You can use the position you have to elevate others beyond the position they've been forced into. And you can refuse to stay silent when you're told to keep your voice down. But it's not a one-time thing, you don't become a better person when you admit to having been a bad one. It doesn't mean one march through the streets or one investigative report. It means not walking away from the issue when you're bored or believe you've done enough or are tired. It means working with people who can't walk away because they live it to help fix it. It means never giving up if you're living through an injustice you had no say in. We're all capable of admitting we're wrong, of working to correct those wrongs, and of ensuring they're never repeated. Yes. Cool.